It's a real pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker today. And is a man uh, recognized for raising the awareness of computer and network security well before it becomes broadly uh, understood. He's also recognized for his groundbreaking work on the economics of security, which is an interesting view of looking at security. He also, as most of you may remember, wrote in 2003 a 24-page report which resonated with many of us, entitled Cybersecurity, The Cost of Monopoly, which is another, word, another way of looking at the security challenges. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a really with great pleasure again and honor that I'm happy to introduce to you today a true free spirit and a security luminary, Dan Gear. Thank you very much. Glasses have become a necessity. Um, of course, you began with good morning, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you. Of course you say that. But um, you can also say that with feeling, and I am doing that. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak with you. The plain text of this talk uh, has been made available to the organizers, and I trust that it will be in due course available to you. Um, I won't be taking questions here this morning, but you're welcome to contact me later and I'll do what I can to reply. Um, I'm very close to not being able to handle the number of uh, emails and the like that I get. Uh, those of you who know Larry Lessig uh, will know what I mean when I say I'm close to declaring uh, bankruptcy in this regard. Um, but nevertheless, I will endeavor to do it and I invite you uh, to do so. Uh, for simple clarity, I'm going to reread the uh, abstract that went with this talk. Power exists to be used. Some wish for cyber safety, which they will not get. Some wish uh, for cyber order, which they will not get. Some have the eye to discern cyber policies that are the least worst thing. May they fill the vacuum of wishful thinking. You know, there are three professions that, as far as I know, um, are tops at beating their practitioners into a state of humility. Um, farming, weather forecasting, and cybersecurity. Um, I actually practice two of those, and as such, let me assure you that the recommendations that follow are presented in all humility. Humility, let me remind you, does not mean timidity. Rather, it means that when a strongly held opinion or belief is proven wrong, that a humble person changes their mind and acknowledges that they've done so. I expect that my proposals uh, will generate a considerable amount of pushback, and changing my mind may well follow. Though I will say it again later, this speech is me talking on my own behalf. As if it needed saying, cybersecurity uh, is now a riveting concern. Jeff was speaking to that as well. Um, a top issue, it's a top issue in many venues, more important than this one. By saying that, I don't mean to insult Black Hat. Rather, it is to note that every speaker, every writer, every practitioner in the field of cybersecurity uh, has wished that its topic and with it us were taken seriously. They've gotten their wish. Cybersecurity is being taken seriously which, as you well know, is not the same as being taken usefully, uh, coherently, or lastingly. Whether we are talking about laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or the non-lawmaking, but perhaps even more significant actions uh, that the executive agencies are undertaking, we, and the cybersecurity issue, have never been more at the forefront of policy and you ain't seen nothing yet. 
I wish that I could tell you that it is still possible for one person to hold the big picture firmly in their mind's eye, to track everything that is going on, going on in our field, to make few, if any, sins of omission. It is not possible. That phase passed sometime in the last six years. I have certainly tried to keep up, but I would be less than candid if I were to say that I know what is going on everywhere. I am not keeping up. Not even keeping up with what is going on in my own country, much, much less all of them, much less 91. Not only has cybersecurity reached the highest levels of attention, it has spread into nearly every corner of daily life. If area is the product of height and width, then the footprint of cybersecurity has, I believe, surpassed the grasp of any single one of us. The rate of technological change is certainly part of that. When younger people ask my advice on what they should do or study to make a career in cybersecurity, I can only advise specialization. Those of us who are in the game uh, early enough and who have managed to retain an overarching uh, generalist knowledge can't be replaced very easily. While those, because while absorbing most new information, most of the time may have been possible when we began practice, no person starting from scratch can do that now. Serial specialization is all that can be done in any practical way. Just look at the Black Hat program. It will confirm that being really good at any one of the many topics presented here all but requires shutting out the demands of being good at all the rest. Why does that matter? Or does it matter? Speaking for myself, I'm not interested in the advantages or disadvantages of some bit of technology unless I can grasp how it is that that technology works. Whenever I see marketing material that tells me all the good things that adopting this or that technology makes possible, I remember what George Santayana said. Skepticism is the chastity of the intellect, and it is shameful to give it up too soon or to the first comer. I suspect that a majority of you share that skepticism. It is part of what being a good security person is all about. By and large, I can tell you, I can tell, I can tell what something is good for once I know how it works. Tell me how it works, and then, but only then, Tell me why you have chosen to use those particular mechanisms for the things you have chosen to use them for. Part of my feeling stems from a long-held and I believe well-substantiated belief that all cybersecurity technology is dual use. Perhaps dual use is a truism for any and all tools from the scalpel to the hammer to the gas can. They can be used for good or for ill, but I know that dual use is inherent and cybersecurity tools. If your definition of tool is wide enough, I suggest that the cybersecurity tool set favors offense these days. Chris English, recently retired um, deputy director of the NSA, remarked that if we were to score cybersecurity the way we score soccer, we'd be 20 minutes into the game and the score would be 462 to 456. That is to say, all offense. I will take his comment as confirming at the highest level not only the dual-use nature of cybersecurity, but also confirming that offense is where the in innovations that only states can afford is going on. Nevertheless, this essay is an outgrowth from, an extension of, that increasing importance of cybersecurity. With the humility of which I spoke, I do not claim that I have the last word. What I do claim is that when we speak about cybersecurity policy, we are no longer engaging in a parlor game. I claim that policy matters are now the most important matters, that once a topic area like cybersecurity becomes interlaced with nearly every aspect of life for nearly everybody, the outcome differential between good policies and bad policies broadens and the ease of finding answers falls. As H.L. Mencken remarked, and I might say rather trenchantly, for every complex problem, there is a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong.
The four verities of government are these. Most important ideas are unappealing. Most appealing ideas are unimportant. Not every problem has a good solution. Every solution comes with side effects. This quartet of verities certainly applies to the interplay between cybersecurity and the affairs of daily living. Over my lifetime, the public expectation of what government can and should do has spectacularly broadened from guaranteeing that you may engage in the pursuit of happiness to guaranteeing happiness in and of itself. The central dynamic internal to government is, and I suspect always has been, that the only way for either the executive or the legislature to control the many subunits of government is by way of how much money they can hand out. Guaranteeing happiness has the same dynamic that the only tool government really has is to achieve the outcome of everybody happy or everybody healthy or everybody safe at all times from things that go bump in the night is through the dispensing of money. This is true in foreign policy. One can reasonably argue that while the United States 2007 troop surge in Iraq provided an improvement in safety, the ultimate sacrifice of the troops lost there may not have been as effective as was the much less publicized arrival of C-130s full of $100 bills with which to buy off potential combatants. Why should cybersecurity be any different? Suppose, however, that surveillance becomes too cheap to meter, that is, that is to say, too cheap to limit through budgetary processes. Does that lessen the power of the legislature more or the power of the executive more? I think that ever cheaper surveillance substantially changes the balance of power in favor of the executive and away from the legislature. While President Obama was referring to something else when he said, I've got a pen and I've got a phone. He was speaking to exactly this idea. Things that need no appropriations exist outside the system of checks and balances. Is the ever wider deployment of sensors in the name of cybersecurity actually contributing to our safety? Or is it destroying our safety in order to save it? To be entirely clear by way of repetition, this essay is written by someone as his own opinion and not on behalf of anyone else. It is written without the supposed benefits of insider information. I hold no clearance, but am instead informed solely by way of open source intelligence. This path may be poised to grow easier. If the chief benefit of a clearance is to be able to see into the future a little farther than those who don't have one, then it must follow that, the pa that as the pace of change accelerates, the difference between how far you can see into, with a clearance versus how far you can see without one will shrink. There are, in other words, parallels between cybersecurity and the intelligence functions insofar as predicting the future has a strong role to play in preparing your defenses for probable attacks. As Dave Vitell of Immunity has repeatedly pointed out, the hardest part of crafting good attack tools is testing them before deployment. Knowing what your tool will find and how to cope with that is surely harder than finding an exploitable flaw in and of itself. This too may grow in importance if the rigor of testing causes attackers to use some portion of the internet at large as their test platform rather than whatever rig they can afford to set up in their own shop. If that is the case, then full-scale traffic logs become an indispensable intelligence tool insofar as when an attack appears to be de novo, those with full-scale traffic logs may be in a position to answer the question, how long has this been going on? The company NetWitness, now part of EMC, is one player who comes to mind in this regard, and there are, of course, others. The, this idea of looking backward for evidence that you previously didn't know enough to look for does certainly have intelligence value, both for the nation state 
and for the enterprise. And there is a lot of traffic that we do not have a handle on. John Quarterman of Internet Perils makes a round number guess that 10% of Internet backbone traffic is unidentifiable as to protocol. Whether he is off by a factor of two in either direction, that is still a lot of traffic. Arbor Networks estimates that perhaps 2% of all identifiable backbone traffic is to use their term raw sewage. There are plenty of other estimates of this sort. To my way of thinking, all such estimates continue to remind us that the end-to-end -end design of the internet was not some failure of design intellect, but a brilliant avoidance of having to pick between the pitiful toy a completely safe internet would have to be versus an internet that was the ultimate tool of state control. In nothing else is it more apt to say, freedom, security, convenience, choose two. Let me now turn to some policy pro uh, proposals on a suite of pressing current topics. None of these proposals are fully formed. But as you know, those who don't play the game don't make the rules. These proposals are not in priority order, though some are more at odds with current practice than others and might, therefore, be said to be more pressing. There are more where these came from, but this talk has a time limit and there is a meta-analysis at the end. So, area number one, mandatory reporting. The United States Centers for Disease Control are respected the world around. When you really get down to it, three capabilities describe the CDC and why they are as effective as they are. One, mandatory reporting of communicable diseases. Two, stored data and the data analytic skill to distinguish a statistical anomaly from an outbreak. And three, away teams to take charge of, say, the appearance of Ebola in Miami. Everything else is details. The most fundamental of these is the mandatory reporting of communicable diseases. At the same time, we have well-established rules about medical privacy. Those rules are helpful. When you check into the hospital, there's a licensure-enforced, accountability-based, need-to-know regime that governs the handling of your data. Most days, that is. But if you check in with bubonic plague or typhus or anthrax, you will have zero privacy, as these, those are the mandatory reporting of communicable disease conditions, as variously mandated not just by the CDC, but by public health law in all 50 states. So let me ask you, would it make sense in a public health of the internet way to have mandatory reporting, a regime for mandatory reporting, for cybersecurity failures? Do you favor having to report cyber penetrations of your firm, or for that matter, your household, to some branch of government or some non-government entity? Should you face criminal charges if you fail to make such a report? 48 states vigorously penalize failure to report sexual molestation of children. The U.S. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act defines a number of felonies related to computer penetrations and the U.S. Code said that it is a crime to fail to report a felony of which you have knowledge. Is cybersecurity event data the kind of data around which you want to enforce mandatory reporting? 46 states require mandatory reporting of one class of cyber failures in the form of their data breach laws. While the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report found and the Index of Cybersecurity confirmed that 70 to 80 percent of data breaches are discovered by unrelated third parties, not by the victim, meaning that the victim might never know if those who do the discovering were to keep quiet. If you discover a cyber attack, do you have an ethical obligation to report it? Should the law mandate that you fulfill such an obligation? My answer to these set of, this set of questions is in fact to mirror the CDC. That is, for the force of law to require reporting of cybersecurity failures that are above some severity threshold that we have yet to negotiate. 
below that threshold, I endorse the suggestion made in a piece two weeks ago, Surviving on a Diet of Poisoned Fruit, by Richard Danzig, uh, Secretary of the Navy under Jimmy Carter and now a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. He made this proposal, and I quote, Fund a data collection consortium that will illuminate the character and magnitude of cyber attacks against the U.S. private sector using the model of voluntary reporting of near-miss incidents in aviation. Use this enterprise as well to help develop common terminology and metrics about cybersecurity. While regulatory requirements for aviation accident reporting are fully est firmly established through the National Transportation Safety Board, there are no requirements for reporting the vastly more numerous and often no less informative near misses. Efforts to establish such requirements inevitably generate resistance. Airlines would not welcome more regulation and fear the reputational and perhaps legal quantity, uh, consequences of data visibility. Moreover, near accidents are intrinsically more ambiguous than accidents. Nevertheless, an alternative plan was forged in 2007 when MITRE, a government contractor, established the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing System, ASIAS, re receiving near-miss data and providing anonymized safety benchmarking and proposed improvement reports to a small number of initially participating airlines and the FAA. In the quotation. Today, 44 airlines are in that program voluntarily. The combination of a mandatory CDC model for above threshold cyber events and a voluntary ASIAS model for below threshold events is what I recommend. That leaves a great deal of thinking still to be done. Diseases are treated by professionals. Malware infections are treated by amateurs. Diseases spread within jurisdictions before they go global. Malware is global from the get-go. Diseases have predictable behaviors. Malware comes from sentient opponents, etc. Don't think that this proposal is an easy one or without side effects. Category two, net neutrality. There's considerable irony in the FCC classifying the internet as an information service and not as a communication service. Insofar as while that may have been a gambit to relieve ISPs of telephone era regulation, the value of the internet is ever more the bits it carries, not the carriage of those bits. The FCC decisions are both several and now old. The FCC classified cable as an information service in 2002. Classified DSL as an information service in 2005. Classified wireless broadband as an information service in 2007. Classified broadband over power lines as an information service in 2008. You get the idea. A decision by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals on this very point appeared earlier this year, but settled little. The question remains, is the Internet a telecommunication service or an information service? I have nothing new to say, actually. Nothing to say about the facts, the near facts, nor the uh, many lying distortions inherent in the debate regarding network neutrality so far are still to come. What I can say is that network neutrality is no panacea, nor is it anathema. People's tastes vary, and so do corporations. What I can say is that the very tastes need to be reflected in a constrained set of choices, rather than the idea that the FTC or some other agency can assure happiness if only it, and only it, rather than corporations or individuals, does the choosing. Channeling for Dr. Seuss, if I ran the zoo, I'd call up the ISPs and say this. Hello, Uncle Sam here. You can charge whatever you like based on the contents of what you're carrying, but you're responsible for that care content if it's hurtful. Inspecting brings with it a responsibility for what you learn. Or you can enjoy common carrier protections at all times, but you can neither inspect nor act on the contents of what you're carrying, and it can only charge for carriage itself bits or bits. Choose wisely. No refunds or exchanges at this window. In other words, ISPs get one or the other. They do not get both. The FCC gets a lot of heartache, but it also gets a natural experiment and whether those who choose common carrier status turn out differently than those who choose multi-tiered service with liability exposure. 
You already have a lot of precedent in law in this space. The United States Postal Service's term of art, sealed against inspection, is reserved for items on which the highest postage rates are charged. Is that worth stirring into the mix? As a side comment, I might add that it was in Dr. Seuss's book, If I Ran the Zoo, that the word nerd first appeared in English. If Black Hat doesn't have an official book, that's the one to pick. <laughs> Topic three, source code and liability. Nat Howard said that security will always be exactly as bad as it can possibly be while still allowing everything to function. But with each passing day, that and still function clause requires a higher standard. As Kim Thompson told us in his Turing Award lecture on trusting trust, there is no technical escape. In strict mathematical terms, you neither trust a program nor a house you created 100%, unless you created it 100% by yourself. But in reality, most of us will trust a house built by a suitably skilled professional. Usually, we will trust it more than one we had built ourselves. And this even if we never met the builder, or even if the builder is long since dead. The reason for this trust is that shoddy building work has had a crucial for or else clause for more than 3,700 years. The Code of Hammurabi from BC 1750, if a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built falls in and kills its owner, then the builder shall be put to death. There's nothing new under the sun. Today, the relevant legal concept is product liability. And the fundamental formula is if you make money selling something, then you better do it well, or you will be responsible for the trouble it causes. For better or poorer, the only two products not covered by product liability are religion and software. <laughs> and software should not escape much longer. Paul Heidenkamp, uh, you may know as PHK at FreeBSD, and I have a straw man proposal on how uh, software liability regulation could be structured. It goes like this. Clause zero. Consult the criminal code to see if damages caused was due to intent or willfulness. You know, we're only trying to assign liability for unintentionally caused damage, whether that's sloppy coding or insufficient testing or cost cutting or incomplete documentation or just plain incompetence. Clause zero moves any kind of intentionally inflicted damage out of scope. That is for your criminal code and to deal with, and most do. Clause one, if you deliver your software with complete and buildable source and a license that allows disabling any functionality or code the licensee decides, your liability is limited to a refund. Clause one is how to avoid liability make it possible for your users to inspect and chop out any, any and all bits of your software they don't want to trust or run. This, that includes a bill of materials, library ABC came from builder XYZ, so the trust has a basis paralleling why there are ingredient lists on processed foods. The word disabling is chosen very carefully. You do not need to give permission to change or modify how the program works only to disable the parts of it that the licensee does not want to trust. Liability is limited, even if the licensee never actually looks at the source code, as long as he has received it, you, the maker, are off the hook. All your other copyrights are still yours to control, and your license can contain any language and restriction you care for, leaving the situation unchanged with respect to hardware locking, confidentiality, secrets, software policy, uh, software privacy, uh, magic numbers, and so forth. Free and open source software is obviously covered by this clause, which leaves its situation unchanged. Clause two, you are liable for whatever damage your software causes when it is used normally in any other case. If you do not want to accept the information sharing in clause one, you are not doing it intentionally as in clause zero, then you fall under clause two and must live with normal product liability, just like manufacturers of cars, blenders, chainsaws, and hot coffee. How dire are the consequences and what constitutes used normally 
is for your legislature and your courts to decide. But let us put up yet another straw man example. A salesperson from one of your longtime vendors visits and delivers new product documentation on a USB key. You plug that into your computer and you copy the files. That is what use normally means. And it should never cause your computer to become part of a botnet, transmit your credit card number to Albonia, or copy all your design documents to the vendor. If it does, your computer's operating system is defective. The majority of today's commercial software would fall under Clause 2, and software houses need a reasonable chance to clean up their act or to move under Clause 1, so a sunrise period is required. We suggest five years and no more. We're trying to solve a dire security problem, and unlimited time is not in our interest. That's it, really. Either software houses deliver quality and back it up with liability, or they will have to let their users protect themselves. The current situation, users can't see whether they need to protect themselves and have no recourse to being unprotected, cannot go on. We prefer self-protection and fast recovery, but others' mileage will likely differ. Would this work? In the long run, absolutely yes. In the short run, it is pertinent it is pretty certain that there will be some nasty surprises as badly constructed source code will get a wider airing. The free and open source community will in parallel have to be clear about what level of care they have taken and their build environments as well as their source code will have to be kept available indefinitely. The software houses will yell bloody murder. On the minute legislation like this is introduced, and any pundit or lobbyist they can afford will spew dire predictions like this law will mean the end of computing as we know it. To which Paul and my considered reply is, well, yes, please, that was exactly the idea. <laughs> uh, number four, strike back. I suspect that a fair number of you have in fact, struck back at some attacker somewhere, or at least done the targeting research, even if you didn't pull the trigger. I trust many of you to identify targets carefully enough to minimize collateral damage. But what we are talking about here is the cyber equivalent of the smart bomb. As I implied earlier, cyber smart bombs are what national laboratories of several countries are furiously working on. In that sense, you do know what is happening behind the curtain, and you do know how hard targeting really is because you know how hard attribution, real attribution, really is. The issue is shared infrastructure, and that issue is not going away. There are some entities that can operate globally and strike back effectively. Microsoft and the FBI are teaming up over the game over Zeus Trojan, for example, but that is expensive therapy and in limited supply. Smaller entities cannot do this. In fact, I would suggest that all smaller entities can do has put their effort into fast recovery. So I dismiss strike back as much as I would like to do it myself. Number five, resiliency. There's been a lot of talk about whether, about what to do when failure is unacceptable and yet inevitable. Heretofore, almost anything that has come to be seen as essential to the public gets some sort of performance standard imposed on it. Electricity and water say. But let's talk about software. For one example, a commonly voiced uh, desire for cryptographic programs is algorithmic agility, the ability to swap from one algorithm to another if the first one becomes unsafe. The security benefit of such a swap is not what you can turn on, but what you can turn off. For that to be possible, the second algorithm has to be in place already, and there has to be a way to choose amongst them. One might argue that implementing algorithm agility actually means a single more complex algorithm or maybe what you want is two algorithms where you always use both, such as encrypting by one algorithm and then uh, uh, super encrypting by another so that if either one fails, it doesn't matter. I say all that just to demonstrate that it is not always simple to have a pre-deployed fallback should something break, the design willpower alone is not enough. So perhaps mandating pre-deployed fallbacks is a bad idea altogether. Perhaps what is needed is a way to reach out and upgrade the endpoints when the time of necessity comes. Real soon now, though, it's embedded systems that will be the most numerous. And I've written about this elsewhere, so I'll just give you the punchline. Embedded systems 
either need a remote management interface or they need to have a finite lifetime. They cannot be immortal and unfixable because to do so is to guarantee that if they live long enough, something bad will happen. If you live long enough, as my wife was a behavioral neuroscientist says, if you live long enough, you'll begin becoming demented. If a piece of software lives long enough, it will be taken over. So embedded systems either have to have a remote management interface or they have to have a finite lifetime. I want to skip over something here in the interest of time. But for those of you who are attending DEF CON, I believe there is an event at DEF CON which actually talks about this, which is this so hopelessly broken session talking about home-based routers which ex exhibit this problem exactly. They're four and five-year-old Linux kernels for which CVE has any number of ways to take them over remotely. It is likely that there is a botnet in Brazil that is using this now. I could take down the internet with that and so could you. I'll let it go at that. You can read this later. And I suggest that if for those of you who are interested in do we have such a problem now that you attend the session um, at DEF CON. I just want to say though that resilience is an area where no one policy can be sufficient. So we need a trio of baby steps. Embedded systems cannot be immortal if they have no remote interface. Embedded systems must have a remote interface if you can't go back to where they are. And swap over is preferable to swap out. Six, vulnerability finding. Vulnerability finding is a job. It's been a job for something like eight years now, give or take. For a good long while, you could do vulnerability finding as a hobby and get paid bragging rights, but now it's a job. It's too hard to do in your spare time, and bragging rights don't count. This was the result of a lot of hard work on some of your parts and a lot of vendors' parts and so forth. I applaud it. But as the, as the last of the four verities of government said, all solutions have side effects, and the side effect here is that once we made it too hard to do as a hobby and hence get paid in bragging rights, we guarantee that those who are finding them don't share, and as such, you go back and take a look, the percentage of all attacks that involve a zero day has risen. And that is unsurprising. In a May article in The Atlantic, Bruce Schneier asked the provocative question around this uh, topic, and that is, are vulnerabilities in software dense or sparse? If they are sparse, then everyone you find and fix meaningfully lowers, meaningfully lowers the number of avenues of attack that are extant. If they are dense, you're just wasting your money. Six take away one is a 15% improvement. 6,000 take away one doesn't matter at all. If a couple of Texas brothers could corner the world's silver market, there's no doubt the US uh, government could openly corner the entire world vulnerability market, and I suggest that we do. We simply announce we'll pay 10x, show us a competing bid and we'll pay you 10x. At first there will be people who say, I hate Americans, I will not sell to them, I only sell to the Ukrainians. That's fine. But when you're paying 10x, you motivate vulnerability finding at a level at which anyone who finds one knows that someone else will find it too in due course and you better sell right away. And if we make them public, that's the crucial point, if we make them public, we zero the inventory of cyber weapons that other people have and that we don't know about. We don't need intelligence to do it. We can zero it where it stands. Of course, this is contingent on Schneier. The answer to Schneier's question being vulnerabilities are scarce, or at least merely numerous. If they are, in fact, uncountably dense, this doesn't help. And we've made the problem worse because we're finding them at a rate where the vendors have to spend all of their time fixing them and it's security theater, oddly enough. So I suggest that we try this. I believe that software, exploitable software vulnerabilities are scarce enough that if we corner the market, we can make a difference. And I've written about this elsewhere that you can, uh, the references are here and you can look it up. Let me note, however, that my colleagues in static analysis report that they regularly see web applications that are two gigabytes in size and have 20,000 variables. Now those can only have been written by a machine, and yet they find vulnerabilities in them, meaning the vulnerabilities were written by a machine. So my question is, how does that change my analysis? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. 
if our reaction is to write ever more complicated apps with machines, which have the capability of creating vulnerabilities faster than you and I can, that may change this. I don't know. It may involve the, vol the uh, liability question that I spoke of earlier, and probably does. Number seven, the right to be forgotten. I've spoken at length in other places about how we're all intelligence agents now because we collect on behalf on each other on behalf of various overlords. Everything we do is identifiable. Uh, this, they, um, you know, you may not have the kind of software I'm talking about already in your pocket or your dashboard or embedded in your smoke detectors, but that's only a matter of time. Your digital exhaust is entirely unique and therefore identifying. Pooling everyone's digital exhaust also has the interesting effect of saying how you differ from the masses. Privacy used to be proportional to that which is impossible to observe, or at least that which is, can be observed but not identified. No more. If you're an optimist or an operatic, then your answer to this problem will tend towards rules of data procedure administered by a government you trust or control. If you are a hacker maker or a pessimist, then your answer will tend towards the operational and your definition of privacy will be mine. You have privacy if you retain the effective capacity to misrepresent yourself. Misrepresentation is using disinformation to frustrate data fusion on the part of those watching you. Some of it may be low tech, such as misrepresenting by paying your therapist in cash under an assumed name, arming yourself not at Walmart but in living rooms, swapping affinity cards at random with like-minded folks, uh, keeping an inventory of misconfigured web servers to proxy through, putting a motor generator between yourself and a smart grid, uh, using Tor for no reason uh, at all, hiding in plain sight when there's no one where else to hide, not having one digital identity that you burnish, cherish, and protect, but as many as you can handle. In short, your fused identity is not a question unless you make it one. Lest you think this is a problem for the random paranoid individual, let me tell you that in the big eye intelligence trade, crafting good cover is getting harder and harder and for the exact same reasons. Misrepresentation is getting harder and harder. If I was running field operations, I would not try to fabricate a complete digital identity. I would just, shall we say, borrow the identity of someone with the characteristics that I wanted. Look up the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace if you want to see where this is likely to go. So after a good bit of waffling, and I admit having waffled for a long time about this, I conclude that a unitary, unfakeable digital identity is no bargain, and I don't want one. I want to choose whether to misrepresent myself. I may rarely use it, but it is my right to do so. If that right vanishes into the panopticon, I have lost something and, in my view, gained next to nothing. In that regard, and acknowledging that it is a baby step, I include that the European Union's right to be forgotten is both appropriate and advantageous and does not go far enough. Being forgotten is consistent with moving to a new town to start over, to changing your name, to a definition of privacy that turns on whether you do or do not have the effective capacity to misrepresent yourself. I will remind you that this is routinely granted to some individuals, such as those who've helped the government and end up in witness protection. A right not to be forgotten is the only check on the tidal wave of observability that a ubiquitous sensor fabric is birthing as we speak. Observability that changes the very quality of what the phrase in public means. Entities that block deep linking to their web resources are neutralizing indexability. Governments of all stripe are irretrievably balkanizing the internet to the same mechanism. The only democratizing break on this runaway train is for individuals to be able, in their own small way, to do the same as other entities. I find it notably ironic that the Guardian newspaper, champ which championed Edward Snowden's revelations about privacy loss, has also has, however, editorialized that no one has the right to be forgotten. Au contraire, Madame et Monsieur, they most assuredly do. Number eight. Internet voting, which I will dismiss for this audience. Fair enough. <laughs> Number nine, abandonment. If I abandon a car on the street, someone eventually claims title. If I abandon a bank account, the state takes it. 
If I abandon real estate and don't remedy trespass, adverse possession takes over. If I don't use my trademark, the rights go over to those who do. If I abandon my children, then everyone is taxed to remedy my actions. If I abandon a patent application, it goes away. If I abandon a storage locker, it ends up on reality TV. <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, Apple computers at 10.5 or less get no updates. Microsoft computers at XP or earlier get no updates. The end of security updates follows abandonment. It is certainly ironic that freshly pirated copies of Windows get security updates that older versions bought legitimately do not. Stating what to me is the obvious policy stance. If company X abandons the code base, then that code base must become open source. Uh, many of us are in a position to, f to work on that, or at the very least, in coupled with the other proposals I've made, learn what it is of that we don't want to run. So either you support it, or you give it over to the public, just like either you drive your car and register it, or it becomes someone else's property. If the two major desktop suppliers update only half of today's, what percentage will they update tomorrow? If you say make them try harder, then the legalistic regulatory position is your position and the ACLU is trying that route. If smartphone auto update becomes a condition of merchant, uh, uh, merchantability and your smartphone holds the keying material that undeniably says that its user is you, then how long before the FISA court orders a special auto update to your phone for evidence gathering. If you say, but all, we already know what they're going to do, don't we? Then the question is what to do about abandoned code bases. I would suggest that open sourcing abandoned code bases is the worst option except for all the others. And if that is too big a question for you to consider before breakfast, start with when a public key certifying authority goes bankrupt, who gets the keys? Number 10, convergence. Let me ask you a question. Are the physical world and the digital world converging? The answer is yes. But the real question is, is meat space becoming more like cyberspace or vice versa? It seems to me that cyberspace, that meat space is becoming more like cyberspace, but let me speak about that. Possibility is num number one is that cyberspace becomes more and more like meat space. Ergo, the recreation of borders and jurisdictional boundaries is what happens next. Possibility number two is that cyber meat space becomes more and more like cyberspace. Ergo, jurisdictional boundaries grow increasingly irre irrelevant, and something akin to one world techno uh, technocratic government soon follows. The former is heterogeneous. The latter is a monoculture of a single nation state. As we all know, resiliency and freedom obtain only from heterogeneity, so converging meat space to cyberspace is the unfavorable outcome. What can we do about it? The Pew, the Pew Research Center asked 12,000 experts the answer to a question, by 2025, will there be significant changes for the worse uh, to the ways in which people get and share content? They got predominantly yes. And they got four kinds of yes. Actions by nation states, lead to more blocking. Trust evaporates in the wake of revelations. Commercial pressures affecting everything from architecture to the flow of information endanger the structure of online life as we now know it, and efforts to fix the too much information problem backfire and make it worse. If cyberspace converges to our physical reality, then we will have balkanization and commercial efforts to artificially create information monopolies. While if the physical world goes toward digital space, then we have greater surveillance, the erosion of trust, and information leakage, and the reaction to that leakage. The reason for this is that the last 20 years have changed this ratio of power. Persons now have much more power than they used to. And the natural reaction for those entities who used to have the power and now do not is to do something about it in a countervailing way. In other words, convergence is an inevitable consequence of the very power of cyberspace in and of itself. I don't argue with uh, various uh, individuals that an increasingly powerful location independent technology in the hands of the many will tend to force changes in the distribution of power. In fact, that is the central theme of this essay, that the power that is growing in the net will soon surpass the ability of our existing institutions to modify it in any meaningful way, so either the net must be broken into manageable chunks, or the net becomes government.
I argue that we are in a, let me, let me just put it this way. It is said that all civil wars are about on whose terms reunification will occur. I would argue that we are, to coin a phrase, in a cold civil war to determine on whose terms convergence occurs. Everything in meat space we give over to cyberspace replaces dependencies that are local and manageable to ones that are not local, and I would argue much less manageable. I say that because the root cause of dependence um, is uh, the root cause of risk is dependence, and most especially dependence on expectations of system state. I say much less secure because one is secure. That is to say, one is in a state of security. If and only if there is the absence of unmitigatable surprise. The more we put on the internet, the broader and more unmitigatable internet surprises can become. This appeared in Bloomberg only this week, where the security industry, the, the financial industry, I was about to say security industry, but I mean the financial kind. The financial industry called for a war council with eight of federal agencies because they can no longer protect themselves from either states or global terrorist actors. Now you think about that for a minute. So here we have the biggest financial firm saying their dependencies are not manageable and that the state's monopoly on the use of force must be brought to bear. What we are talking about is that they have no way to mitigate the risk of common mode failure. Bounding dependence is the only way out. If we don't bound dependence, we invite common mode failure. NIST has a long article on that I was going to quote from, which I'll let go. But you get the point. It finishes with this. The most insidious source of common mode failures are design faults that cause redundant copies of the same software process to fail under identical conditions. In sum, as a matter of policy, everything that is officially categorized as a critical infrastructure must conclusively show how it can operate in the absence of the Internet. The 2008 financial crisis proved that we can build systems more complex than we can operate. The best policy counter to which has been the system of stress tests thereafter administered to the banks. We need stress tests in our field even more. There's a lot to say. You never know when to quit. The problem with this is it comes from the complexity, and I will close here. It comes from the very complexity that Jeff spoke of and that all of you know. I've long preferred to hire security people who are more than anything else, sadder but wiser. They and only they know what comes, but why most of what commercially succeeds, succeeds only so long as attackers don't give it their attention. Well, what commercially fails is not because it didn't work, but because it wasn't easy or sexy or cheap enough. Those are not rose-colored glasses. Those are glasses spattered with real politique. Sadder but wiser, however, or what hires, however, come only from people who've experienced private tragedies, no one who's experienced at the scale we're now talking about. There are no people who are sadder but wiser about what happens when you connect everything to everything. Until such people are available, I will busy myself with reducing my dependence on and thus my risk exposure to the digital world, even though that will be staken mistaken for curmudgeonly nostalgia. Call that misrepresentation, if you like. There's never enough time. Thank you for yours. Let's give Dan another round of applause. I think Dan, Dan enumerated a lot of my concerns. Thank you.